Hi, and welcome to lesson two of our periodic table and bonding unit. Here we're going to talk about some of the trends that we see when we consider the elements arranged in the periodic table. Our last lesson dealt with an introduction to the periodic table, and you really should check it out if you haven't yet. But here in lesson two, we're going to look at some of the trends that we see with the elements arranged in the periodic table. So an obvious first question is, well, what exactly is a trend? So a trend is a general pattern. And general is really important because there are going to be some exceptions for each of the trends that we talk about here. I don't care about the exceptions and you shouldn't either, particularly right now. We really just want to focus on the overall patterns. So let's go in and take a look. Our first trend is in atomic radius or the distance from the nucleus of the atom to the edge of the electron cloud. It can be very tricky to measure this because of the quantum mechanical nature of the electrons. At the same time, we have ways of doing it. The most common way is through what's called the covalent radius, which is half of the distance between the two nuclei in a covalent bond. This is generally measured in picometers or trillionths of a meter. So for instance, here are four different diatomic elements bound to each other, and you can see how the atomic radius was calculated for each of them. This periodic table shows you the atomic radii of the different elements. Since it's covalent radii, we don't see anything for group 18. That's because the group 18 elements generally do not bond, but we can see the radii for all of the other elements. And if you look at this trend, you can see that as we go across a period from the metals to the nonmetals, as atomic number increases, that our radius generally decreases. Similarly, as we go down a group, as our atomic number increases, generally the radius increases. And that's the trend. In a period, the radius of the atom decreases as atomic number increases. Take a moment and see if you can figure out why. Did you get it? Here's the answer. The increased nuclear charge of the atom, as we add additional protons, pulls the valence electrons closer to the nucleus. This is called Coulombic attraction, and it's actually going to be responsible for a lot of the trends that we see out over the course of this lesson. Similarly, in a group, the radius of the atom generally increases as atomic number increases. Any thoughts as to why? The reason is because the increased number of principal energy levels increases the distance between the valence and the nucleus. In addition, all of those kernel electrons are actually going to shield the nucleus from the valence and absorb some of the force that otherwise would be felt by those valence electrons. This is atomic radius graphed out for many of the elements on the periodic table. You can see that the group one elements are up at the top, and you can see that as we go down that group from lithium to cesium, that the atomic radius increases. Similarly, we can see a periods elements, starting with the group one element, going down to the noble gas element in that period, and you can see that the trend is for atomic radius to decrease. You can see that there are definitely some exceptions, but I'm not interested in those exceptions right now, and you shouldn't be either. While we're talking about atomic radius, we should also remember that ionic radius is going to be different from atomic radius. Positive ions, or what we call cations, have radii that are smaller than their parent atoms, and negative ions, or what we call anions, have radii that are larger than their parent atoms. Our next trend is going to look at what's called electronegativity. So electronegativity is defined as the attraction an atom has for the electrons that it has access to in a chemical bond. It's bonded electrons. This is measured according to the Pauling scale. So the gentleman above me is Linus Pauling and he's the one who developed this scale. Fluorine has the strongest attraction for bonded electrons. It's assigned an electronegativity value of 4.0 and everybody else just kind of goes down from there. Noble gases, of course, generally have no electronegativity values because they generally do not bond. This periodic table shows you the electronegativity values of different elements. And you can see that in a period, as atomic number increases, so does electronegativity. And in a group, as atomic number increases, electronegativity actually decreases. Let's go in and think about the reasons why. So in a period, the electronegativity of the atom increases as atomic number increases. My question to you is why? Any thoughts? The answer is because of that smaller radius. Since the radius is smaller, the valence electrons are going to be closer to the nucleus. And since they're closer to the nucleus, there's going to be more of a nuclear pull on bonded electrons, more of that Coulombic attraction. In a group, the electronegativity of the atoms generally decrease as atomic number increases. Any thoughts as to why? The answer has to do with the larger radius. The larger radius of the atom moves the valence farther from the nucleus, which means that there's less of a nuclear pull on bonded electrons. Here we see electronegativity for most of the elements on the periodic table graphed out. And you can see that in a period, starting with group one, which I've done here in red dots, and ending with group 17, or the halogen, which I show here in green dots, you can see that within a period, 
electronegativity generally increases. Within a group, all of the red dots or all of the green dots, you can see that electronegativity generally decreases. Our last major trend that we need to be familiar with is what's called first ionization energy. This is defined as the amount of energy needed to remove the most loosely held electron from an atom in the gaseous state. And this is measured in kilojoules per mole. Here you can see the first ionization energies of many of the elements on the periodic table. And I'm sure that you can see that within a period, as atomic number increases, first ionization energy also increases. In a group, as atomic number increases, first ionization energy decreases. Let's think about the reasons for why that is. So in a period, the first ionization energy of the atom increases as atomic number increases. Any thoughts as to why? It's very similar to the reasons for electronegativity. The smaller the atomic radius, the closer the valence electrons are going to be to the nucleus, and so the more nuclear pull there will be on valence electrons. As a result, we'll need to invest more energy in order to remove a valence electron from the atom. Within a group, the first ionization energy of the atom decreases as atomic number increases. Can you figure out why? The reason has to do with that larger atomic radius. As the radius gets larger, the valence electrons get farther from the nucleus, which means that there's less nuclear pull on the valence. And so as a result, you need to put in less energy in order to remove a valence electron. Here you can see first ionization energy for many of the elements on the periodic table graphed. And you can see that within a period, going from lithium to neon, for instance, first ionization energy generally increases. Similarly, within a group, for instance, the noble gas is up at the top, first ionization energy generally decreases as atomic number increases. Those are the major trends that you need to be familiar with, but we can put all of those trends together to consider the character of the element. When we talk about an element's character, we're trying to describe how closely an element's properties match that of its given type, its metallic character, or its metalloid character, or its non-metallic character. And really, we're only going to focus on metals and non-metals. You have a chart listing the character of the different types of elements on page 5 of your Unit 6 packet. Not a bad idea to go there and check it out. Well, let's go in and look at metallic character and non-metallic character. Metals characteristically have low electronegativities, low ionization energies, and they easily lose electrons to form positively charged cations. Metallic character is simply the degree to which an element matches the characteristics of metals. If we consider metallic character on the periodic table in a group, as atomic number increases, metallic character is also going to increase. And in a period, as atomic number increases, metallic character is going to decrease. My question to you is, what is the most metallic metal on the periodic table. Pause the video, take a moment, write down your answer, and then when you're ready, let's go and look at the big reveal. So if you're using the trend that we just discussed, you probably came up with francium, and you're technically right. However, francium is radioactive, and there's not very much francium on the planet, so nobody's ever really gonna have to deal with francium. So for all intents and purposes, the most metallic metal that's stable on the planet is cesium and cesium is incredibly reactive. It is not found by itself in nature. It's always bound in a compound. And in this example, it's actually in a vacuum because upon exposure to oxygen, it will spontaneously oxidize and burst into flames. Nonmetals have high electronegativities, high ionization energies, and they easily gain electrons to form negatively charged anions. An element's nonmetallic character refers to the degree to which an element matches the characteristics of a nonmetal. If we look at the periodic table, within a group, non-metallic character is generally going to decrease with atomic number. And within a period, non-metallic character is generally going to increase with atomic number. My question to you is, what is the most non-metallic non-metal on the periodic table? Pause the video, take a moment, write down your answer, and when you're ready, let's go through the big reveal. So you may have picked a noble gas, but remember, noble gases are weirdos. They're certainly non-metals, but they don't behave like non-metals traditionally behave, because they don't gain or lose any electrons due to the fact that they have that full valence. When we're talking about non-metallic character, we're really talking about the ability to gain electrons, so that eliminates the noble gases from contention. So the most non-metallic non-metal on the periodic table is actually fluorine. This is a sample of pure liquid fluorine, which has to be produced in very specialized kinds of setups. Pure fluorine does not exist in nature by itself either. It's also incredibly reactive, and upon exposure to air, it will spontaneously burst into flames as well. Let's wrap up here with some brief notes on reference table S. So reference table S lists electronegativities, ionization energies, and atomic radii for any elements that you need to be familiar with at the regents level. There are really two ways to approach any question that you're going to see that deals with periodic trends, what we might call the easy way and the hard way. 
The easy way is simply to learn the trends and to use your knowledge of the trends in order to reason your way through the questions. The hard way is to look up the values for whatever the question is asking you about on reference table S and then use that to answer the question. It's important to understand that the hard way takes much longer and you're much more likely to make a mistake. At the same time, if you sit down for an assessment and you blank on the trends, you can always go to reference table S and look up the actual values to get the answers that you need. Thanks so much for watching our discussion of periodic trends. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure that you can describe the concepts of atomic radius, electronegativity, ionization energy, and elemental character. Make sure that you can analyze the trends discussed in this video to compare and contrast a provided selection of elements if I give them to you in a problem. And finally, make sure that you can relate the trends discussed in this video to the atomic structure of the elements in a group and in a period. If you can do those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have. You can always leave them in the comments below the video or get in touch with me through the information in the info field. Thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.